Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the stars of the new Hulu dramedy from acclaimed writer John Green. It's called Looking for Alaska. And in it, Charlie Plummer plays Miles Halter, a precocious teenager coming of age at a boarding school filled with mean jocks, overbearing teachers, and a girl named Alaska, played by Christine Froseth. Let's take a look. Teenagers think they're invincible. Don't you know that I don't know how right they are. Sometimes you lose a battle, but mischief always wins a war. I'm not going to be one of those people who sits around talking about what they're going to do. I'm just going to do it. I go to seek a great perhaps. That's why I'm going start seeking a great perhaps. All right, this is up for some fun. Everybody, please welcome Jay Lee, Danny Love, Christine Froseth, and Charlie Plummer of Looking for Alaska. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on the show. I've watched two episodes. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's a lot like being a teenager, but sort of heightened. A uh, lot more hijinks than I think most teenagers get into. I mostly sat around and watched movies in my room alone. <laughs> it's all right. Um, uh, talk to me about the show. How did you get involved? I, I got involved. I, uh, I think it's on. It's on? Okay. I got involved. Um, I, I had read the book when I was like 15. And then originally it was going to be a film. And I heard about it then. And I really, really wanted to do it. And then at the time, this was about five years ago, I, I met with some people, but ultimately they just said, you know, you're just too young for it right now, and it it came and went, and then and then the movie never ended up happening, and then when this kind of came back around, it was the first thing I, as soon as I heard about it. Too young for it, but you were like 16. I was the appropriate. You were the age. age. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that works. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, and then um, and then I just got on the phone with Josh and Stephanie, who who were the showrunners on this, and. And and they had been working on this for the last fifteen years, and um, and and ever since they were the first people to option the book before it even came out, and so hearing their story with it, and then it all just kind of came together. It's John Green's first book, right? Yeah. Like yeah. The Fault in Our Stars, which is him, isn't it? Yes. Yes, that's correct. That's later. <laughs> I'm dating myself. I'm sorry. I'm just like no, not no. an age for the John Green audience. <laughs> I appreciate it though. Um, but this was the first book, and it's semi autobiographical, right? He went to a boarding school. Outside of Alabama? He did. He did go to a boarding school outside. And, and Christine and I actually got the opportunity to go before we started shooting the show with John and Sarah Smith, who did the first episode. We went to the school, and we just drove around where, like, his old stomping ground, grounds for a few days and, and got a sense of the school. It's changed a lot since then. And obviously there are things that I think he definitely drew from in the book, a lot of uh, most of its fiction, I think. But, but just getting to hear about his time there and and the connections that he had and especially his connections to these characters and uh, I think how special each one of these characters was to him and I think for all of us what was so impactful that was that uh, pretty immediately he really gave us the freedom to to really have these people be our own now and 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 to really take ownership over that and, and that was something that was really important I think especially because this story really is just about these kids now the show takes place in 2005 right now in 2005 I was you're old but I was probably the same age that you guys are now and so all of these references all of this music I I click with right away I'm like oh yeah the postal service of course we listen to that all the time while we were crying in our dorm rooms or like you know trying to make out with somebody that's what we put on it was the romantic music but did you did anyone give you a soundtrack or give you mixtapes to listen to so you would know some of the music of this time yeah, we definitely had a, a Looking for Alaska soundtrack for sure that put us in the mindset of these characters. But we kind of on set created our own soundtrack. We just listened to a lot of stuff that we could all relate to. And I like a lot of the music I listen to now just brings me back to shooting the show. We got a bunch of different songs that a lot of Kirk Franklin was listening to on our set <laughs> just to get us through those long days, those 14, six hour days. So Kirk, if you're watching this, we love you. Love theory. <laughs> Out now. <laughs> uh, Christine, you, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you were going to say? I was just going to say, like, every now and then our showrunners, Josh and Stephanie, would make, like, some cheesy joke about, like, 
by the way, this is what MySpace was, and all of us would be like, oh, what was oh, MySpace? My we weren't around for MySpace, you know, but, you know, <laughs> we got by. Screw you guys. <laughs> uh, Christine, uh, you play Alaska, who's a, a very complex teenage girl, going through a lot, I think, that is uh, yet unrevealed to me in terms of the amount of episodes that I've gotten to. Uh, what is it like to play someone who has a clearly has a rich interior life but doesn't share that with anybody on screen? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I still don't really know who she is, to be honest. I'm still trying to figure her out. It was really terrifying because I feel like there were a lot of expectations around who Alaska was, you know, in the book, and everyone has their own journey while reading it. Um, so I just really had to let that go and try to just tap into um, my perspective and a lot of conversations with Josh and Stephanie and John himself. So it was just a lot of lot of conversations, and we had, like, crazy rehearsal periods, <laughs> which were a lot of weird games um, to just try and build that inner life and the exterior life and, and make that. What did that. you guys do during the rehearsal periods? <laughs> it was brought um, up. I, uh, I shouldn't have mentioned it. You played yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot, a lot of strange things, but all of it, Sarah was so great about just creating this dynamic among the three friends, especially because Pudge doesn't come into the story till a little bit later. Right. So she wanted to make sure that it felt like we had our own dynamic much before he got here. So a lot of it was just. Uh, <laughs> A lot of it was just playing with those dynamics of like, you know, Alaska is kind of the top dog in the crew and how we both fall into that. And uh, it's like really intense, Simon says. Like, yeah, a lot. Simon, Simon says, says on steroids, you yeah, know. Pretty much, pretty much. What does that mean? I'm <laughs> sorry. Like, I have to know, like, there needs to be. I it up to your, your imagination. The mangoes <laughs> one time. There's an anecdote here that has to be shared. What, what does Simon says on steroids look like? What does that mean? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Jeez. Take it away, Danny. <laughs> Man, look, she may have fed us some mangoes. Did you guys have to like situation. be dogs or something? I had to be my pets. Right. <laughs> and I, I, was had part to, of this. I had to boss them around when they were behaving. That's what it, she had to boss us around. And I had just happened to bring like a, a carton of mangoes that day. So Sarah was like, ooh, this is great. So you boss them around. And if they do something good, you give them a mango. <laughs> So she she fed us. <laughs> this is why I didn't want to get into it, because the way you looking at me, it was strange. But somehow it worked. <laughs> it worked. It made you feel subservient to her. It did, because I wanted them mangoes. Okay. Yeah, mangoes are great. Yeah. Good fruit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you two, the two of you really play, um, I mean, this school, this private school is on the outskirts of Birmingham, Alabama. It's a fairly segregated school, or at the very least, uh, there's very few minority students in it. And you two, your two characters are kind of those two, really, at the school. What is it like to sort of represent that for the show? And then also, if you are representing the show, you're representing that for the greater world as well. Oh, well, for me, I think that it's a dangerous world in which we can really fall into a conversation about race. But what I took from this story is I don't think it's about race as much as it is about class. Mm -hmm. So I think that it was important to note that Takumi, he was one of the rich kids at this school. And me and Alaska were actually, you know, we were scholarship kids, so we both had a lot more on the line. So... This school, Culver Creek, was a lot more about what race, or not what race you fell into, but what your class was. Were you rich? Were you poor? And that kind of created the social dynamic. So for me, it was, I tried to not focus on that, but when it came to my character, Josh and Stephanie were so great about allowing me input, simple things like the way my house was decorated. Uh, and I just try to bring the essence of what black culture was like to the show. But for the most part, they already really had a great handle on it. It was just small things like when they were decorating my house, you know, my mom was super religious in the show. So I was like, OK, I know there's going to be a picture of Jesus. Now, is this black Jesus or white Jesus? And they were like, that's a great point. These are things that we got to think about. So we definitely had a black Jesus in that house. And in the second episode of the show, there's a, a debutante ball or something of, is, is it called a debutante ball? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, where your yeah, characters, uh, your character's white girlfriend, uh, uh, her parents won't allow you to step on stage with her and to escort her. Obviously, I don't think that's a class issue. I think that's that is a race issue. 
but there's also this 2005 aspect of it where it's like, we'll allow you this much, son, but not that much because right. that's stepping over the line for, for us. What was it like shooting that episode and diving into that story? Um, that was tough because I believe that was also something that I tried to take in for the colonel. Does he feel like this is a race thing going on or does he feel like this is a class thing going on? Because, you know, at this school, there's never any, like, racial slurs that anyone ever says to me. It's always like, you're poor. You're not like us because you don't have money, which can also become a race issue because they're like, it's a thin line. It's like few and far between. But everybody on set was so gracious about shooting those scenes, and I always felt comfortable to go to those places. And it was just tough to kind of, as a character, try to figure out, like, do these people hate me because of the color of my skin or because I'm poor? Where, where it, does the disconnect take place? So it was a confusing scene to shoot as an actor, but also my character was going through those thoughts as well. So it's it also, it's not, it's not an aspect of hate necessarily. What's so interesting about the dynamic, especially with the father, is that he doesn't necessarily hate him. He just will only allow a certain amount. Right. Uh, There's uh, a line that yeah. you can't cross. Yeah. Which is a form of hate <laughs> in a way, but it's not, the, most, it's not the direct kind. He hate no me i don't know that he hates me but he hating on me for sure uh jay talk about your character uh so i play i play takumi who's one of the the four friends in the the band of misfits um i uh i'm the guy who knows everything in the school um and i think you know just because we're we're, we're we've already been talking about it and discussing it i mean for for me the in, in within the story and the show the the race thing doesn't doesn't come up as far as my my character goes um, and for me, that was also kind of an important part of my experience as, as an actor, playing the part and also, you know, being within the, within the story and the world itself, is that, you know, we're in this time where we're talking about, you know, normalizing and, and repre representing. And I, I think just to have somebody, a, a person of color there on screen and, and not have it be a big deal to anyone, I think that, that to me, is, is says multitude. It, it, says, it says a whole lot. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I, I'm currently on and... It's 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 an issue that I'm continuing to think about, obviously, but that's currently what I'm chewing on in my mind. Um, but the <laughs> so I played Takumi, and I'm like the know-it-all, I'm the go-between. You know, D Denny mentioned a little little bit about uh, Takumi's own wealth status. Um, I think something that I didn't realize while I was reading the book is that uh, Takumi is very drippy, and let me just say, our Takumi has a whole lot of drip. <laughs> drip. Okay. Take it away, Danny. All right. Uh, drip. You know what swag is. Oh, okay. And you know what is sauce is. Is drip a is. new word for swag? Yeah, swag. I mean, swag. it elevated from swag to sauce. Uh, you may have even missed the sauce era. I think I missed the sauce now era. now we done elevated to drip. <laughs> and have you seen these people? There's a whole lot of drip on this A lot stage. of drip going on You on are stage. drippy as well. Oh, thank you so much. I yeah. love to be drippy. <laughs> thank you. But you know what they say, drip too hard. Don't stand too you close. You get wet. <laughs> oh, no, don't stand too close. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. You do get, get too wet. Hard. You do get you wet. Get wet. <laughs> you could drown. <laughs> you got to be careful. Chip too hard, form a puddle. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, enough. I love uh, Charlie, uh, your character is extremely precocious. We see him in the beginning reading uh, James Joyce. Um, I read James Joyce when I was in high school. I thought I was so cool and thought I understood it, and then I read it again like 15 years later, and I was like, I had no idea what I was <laughs> reading. Um, how much of Joyce did you read? How much did you feel like you had to read? How much did you relate to this character who's kind of thinks he's wise beyond his years? I definitely related to him a lot in that sense because I think when I was about 15 or 16, you know, a lot of my time was spent at home reading and watching movies and, and I really felt like I had uh, accumulated a, a lot of knowledge, but there was also the big thing that I connected with the character was that real sense of wanting to experience life in its fullest form and, and, and really get out there and, and go through things and, and make connections with people and... Um, and that was something I remember being 15 or 16 and feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of done just like reading about these people. And that was the really, I mean, right away in the story, you see this kid and he says that pretty much exactly. Like I'm done just reading about people who had great lives. I really want to do the same for myself. And that was something I really connected with. But, um, but yeah, actually John, before we started the show, John had sent me an email with a list, uh, like a, basically the library that Miles would have had. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get as many books as possible, but I, I don't know if I got all of them. It was a pretty long list. Do you it's remember what some of those books were? Not off the top of my head. I mean, it was a lot of, it was a lot of biographies, because that, of course, is what Miles is right. obsessed with, which is the last words thing. Um, I can't, 
can't remember now what all of those. So you get to set, and these three have been playing weird. Yeah. No, I was having a great time. Sub dom games together for a few weeks prior. It was so funny. They would come back to the apartments, and they'd be like, "Man, it was a long day." I was like, "Oh, I was just hanging out buying groceries," and they were like, "Yeah, we had to like be on leashes today." A little strange. <laughs> Never would have imagined something like that for this show. <laughs> um, what did that actually create a sense of? Uh, did you feel excluded a little bit from their dynamic, and did that help the performance? Um, I don't know if I felt excluded so much. I mean, it was really important for me uh, as soon as we got out there because we were staying in rural Louisiana, and that's where we shot the show. And so we were all kind of away from our hometowns and away from all of our, our people that we usually see every day. And so it was something that was really important to me. We had, we had like four weeks of rehearsal, and so right away I really wanted to make sure that we all were just like really connected and I had a real open door policy and like usually they would all come and hang out at my place after and we'd all eat together and really just spending that time because I mean what you do end up seeing in the show is that these kids are really spending every single second together and it's hard to replicate that and so I really wanted to to create that tone as much as possible um so you know I mean, I did feel a little FOMO about the no leash thing. I would have loved to at least seen what that looked like, but at the same time, I got to, you know, count my blessings. <laughs> did you guys, I mean, you guys are all like pretty young actors and you're all on set together with a bunch of other young actors. Was there a lot of trouble on set? Did you find that the producers and the creators of the show had trouble wrangling you ever and everybody was sort of playing, was that art imitating life at all? I don't think so. We didn't do a whole lot of pranks or anything crazy like that. We were actually, I think, a pretty pretty tame group for, you know, the context of the show and all. Because most of the people on the show are already working actors, so it's not like this was crazy to anybody. We were just all coming trying to be professional, and most of the fun was had on camera. And most of the time, we were just chilling, trying to restore after. And, and I think there's also something to be said about the fact that this project has been, you know, 14 years in the making, you know? And I think the, the people that in the crew as, as well, you know, people had signed on to this project because it meant so much to right. so many different people. So um, we honored that as, as, as best we could. And I think from the first day that we stepped on set, we were we were immersed in <laughs> rural yeah. Louisiana, but we were immersed in this, this world. And I think there was a great respect for that time and that space that everybody had committed themselves. Yeah, I think to Jay's point, everybody wanted to make this the best piece of work they ever made. So everyone was super passionate and just ready to work. Yeah. Christine, I imagine uh, Alaska is the kind of character you could take a lot from or learn from. Did you learn anything from, from playing her? Yeah, I mean, I really admire her strength um, with everything she's gone through and how, I mean, maybe not... I mean, no, how she's handled most of it or some of it and um, how vocal she is and how she really stands up for herself. I, I really want to take that from her and just her curiosity in life. And yeah, so I guess strength, curiosity and standing up for yourself. Um, there's another cat. There's other lots of other cast members on the show, but one cast member I love who's not here is Timothy Simons, who plays ah, uh, the dean, the principal, right? Yeah, the dean. Uh, He's amazing. Uh, he's extremely funny. He has, I think, a great line in the second episode where he says something like, my wife just left. It's no big deal. It's only a 13-year relationship or something like that, uh, which is like a classic Timothy Simons line. Yeah. What was it like uh, working with him? Tim is like, he's actually just such a great guy. He's so fun to have on set. And he never treated us like we were like young, like kids or anything like that. He would hang out. Some days he would come to set on days he wasn't even working. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, we are in rural Louisiana, so he would probably he be bored. To do. Yeah. He needed something to do, but he would just come to set and crack jokes and, you know, I didn't know at the time how big of a deal he was from, you know, Veep. I mean, the man's won Emmys and things like that, but he never treated anybody with anything less than respect and just having fun. He's actually a hilarious guy in real life, too. I mean, there's there's so many qualities about Timothy Simons that I think are that are worth mentioning. I mean, when when uh, Clea Duvall, who's also on V, as you probably I love know, Clea, on set, she was she was directing episode five, and the two of them. Wow were just insane. You couldn't keep up with them. They're just, their wit is incredible. Um, but, you know, I just to piggyback off, off of what Denny is saying, I think of all those things, he, he's just a, such a humble, down-to-earth, grounded guy. And so, so to have him and, and also the great Ron Cephas Jones on set, you know, just, just having the, the two of their energies with us was, I don't know, you can't beat that. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question? 
I do. Hey there. Hi, Hi my name is Chelsea. And uh, my friends and I have a question for Charlie. How do you prepare for a role in TV versus a movie role? That's, I like that question. That's a good question. Oh, thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, this is actually my first experience with television, uh, really. I, I'd done TV a long time ago, but it was interesting because when I originally signed on to do it, I'd only read the first three scripts, I believe, and there's eight episodes all together. So, of course, I knew that they were going to be pulling from the book a lot. So I really, for this specific one, really just kept going back to the book as much as I could. But um, but it was actually it was interesting because I think it's it's a lot easier with film when you you know what the arc of the story is and you can really plan it out you know way ahead of time. It's a little bit different with TV, obviously, um, just because there's more material. But it was really wonderful. I think we all just got really lucky too because Josh and Stephanie, who were the showrunners were just so collaborative and really receptive. I mean, there was a, an experience where Denny had really wanted a scene uh, in one of the later episodes with Ron, and he talked to Josh about it, and Josh ended up writing it, and it's, in my opinion, one of the best shows, I mean, best scenes in the show. And, and really just that tone on set of, of really just listening to one another, and, and that was really set from them, but also uh, John Green, who wrote the book as well. So that was really helpful. I think it would have been a lot more difficult if that was not the tone on set, but... Uh, but yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more. Hi, guys. So hey. we have a question from our site, buildseries.com. And it's, uh, if you could make a playlist for your character, what type of music would be on it? For me, it's going to be a lot of Lil Wayne. He had, uh, <laughs> what was his, I think the Carter came out in 2005. And a lot of Usher, too. Yeah. Usher, yeah, y'all remember, yeah. For, for the huh? character for no, me. No, this is almost just for me. I, <laughs> I forgot the question. I'm like, oh. Every, everything you <laughs> said, though, I would apply to Takumi. <laughs> That's definitely a Takumi kind of vibe. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just stick with my answer. What y'all feeling? Um, Mazzy Star. Um, yes, Killers. Uh, yeah. Delwater Gap. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are we just talking contemporary? Or, yeah, we can... Oh, period or contemporary? I was thinking period. Whatever you think your character would like, listen to. It. John Green said his his favorite song for the story was um, the song Love, Love, Love by the Mountain Goats. So that was a big one, I know. Yeah. For, for all of us, yeah. Yeah, the Mountain Goats feature on the soundtrack, right? I think the Magnetic Fields a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Clap Your Hands, Say Yeah are in there as well. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff from... That age, when I was that age, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, guys, uh, the show is beautiful. Incredible performances all all around. It comes out October 18th, right? Yes, sir. On Hulu. Everybody give them a huge round of applause for being here. Let's hear it.